Uh, thank you, Colin. That was a very nice intro. We're gonna we're gonna start from the beginning here. We're gonna go to the next slide. Um, we're gonna start in 1997. Uh, on the screen here, we've got Channel Zero. Brian, if you wanna just give us a real quick uh, idea of what you were sure. doing at the time there. Um, this is. Uh this is the first comic I ever made. I was a student at, at Parsons. Um, and at that point, I wanted to, to draw comics. I, wasn't, I, I hadn't written anything yet. And this book was, um, part of it was done as my senior year thesis project. project. And I ended up writing it as, as well as drawing it, because I didn't know any other writers. And I was a control freak, I guess. I don't know, it was like my, my thing, so I, I wanted to. Uh, yeah, you know, I didn't want any anybody else's, uh, you know, work into it. So, uh, yeah, so like I did part part of it in, for a school, and printed it up at Kinko's and took it around and uh, to editors. Um, I went to a com comic book con convention, kind of handed copies out to anybody who would take take one, and uh, based on that, it got picked up at uh, Image Comics. And uh, I did about five, five issues of that, which is what that book is there. And um, that's the first and last book I ever drew. After, after that, I just started to get writing work and edit. I've never really, really been able to get any <laughs> work drawing. I don't know. So There's some more art from Channel Zero. Um, this is a... The Ginny One spinoff came later. Was that? Yeah, um, yeah. A couple of years later, I, um, I mean, there was a lot of. I, I felt a lot of pressure to sort of re revisit this a book, um, but at this point, I was like, you know, I was like, felt like I was, I was, I was a writer. I was nowhere near fast enough, or had the kind of time. <clears throat> that it, that it takes to uh, to draw a graphic novel, so um, I found this uh, artist named Becky Clunan, um, who was uh, also a student. And like, I mean, I had nothing to offer her, but she agreed to do the book any, anyway, and which, ended, which ended up being a very, you know, like a long-term friendship now and like a work partner, a partnership that's, that's lasted about a decade. Um, so that was sort of, a, I mean, it's a, it's a prequel book, but it sort of is, um, um, you know, it just kind of, kind of kind of expands upon the upon the world and the main character of Channel Zero. Can you uh, just give a real brief idea what Channel Zero is about? Yeah, sorry. It's um, I was like a fairly, uh, I was like a sort of a stereotypical angry college student, angry art art stu student, and this was right in the middle of the the worst part of the Giuliani years. Or I thought it was bad anyway. I, I guess I still do. Um, so I was like reacting to like a lot of what I perceived as like you know social injustice, injustices around around me. And, and it's very much. I mean, it's kind of embarrassing a bit to like admit, admit that. I mean, it was very very much like you know a college student kind of like you know like getting getting up on his soap soapbox. Um, so it's sort of a it's sort of a future in New York City. Um, that's been sort of like take, take, uh, taken over by a very authoritarian type of type of gov government, and there's a lot. Of, I mean, it's the '90s, so there's like a lot of like emerging media stuff and hacking. It's very very much of its of its time, and uh, yeah, I mean that's it, it's interesting because it was definitely the first instance of what has become frequent books in my career where I've sort of, you know, taken on social issues. Um, but obviously as I age and as the world has uh, changed, um, my like approach has, has altered. Um, it's gotten a lot more nuance, less like sort of black and white and angry. Um, and also it's sort of interesting to think of these books because I look back on it now and, and in that story, um, you know the the worst thing the government in that story could could do to you was like take away your freedom of speech, which just feels very quaint. I mean, how much has changed <laughs> since nine eleven and everything? Where now, you know, obviously they do so much worse. Um, so it's kind of kind of an interesting sort of like at least for me like this like snap snapshot of time in my life and and what uh, what was happening around around me. 
So 2001, that's uh, Jenny 1, which is the sequel to Channel Zero, or prequel. Uh, also, The Couriers, if you want to talk about that just a little bit. Yeah, that was a, I, I was a bike messenger in um, college for, for a couple of years, and I sort of... I sort of had this like kind of a vaguely silly urge to write this story about like a really sort of amped up extreme like bi bike messengers in the city um, and it is it's pretty tongue in, tongue in cheek it's like unabashedly like high action um, I guess they would call it like Tar Tarantino esque now uh, and I actually managed to, to get like four four books out of that out of that idea. Um, I did one every year during during that time from like two thousand one until four. Um, it's it's fun. I mean, it's very different from from stuff that I'm doing now, but it's. Uh, like, like, like again, it's very kind of representative of what I was doing at the time in comics, which is really, I mean, is, I was working a day, a day job, so comics to me were sort of a, sort of a thing to do with, with my friends and have a fun. Like, it, it, was, it hadn't yet, yet become, a, become a career. I think at the time, <clears throat> as much as you were known as an artist or a writer, you were also known as a designer, and this is around the time the Global Frequency covers came about. Uh, along with a lot of other design work at Rockstar Games, I guess. Was yeah, that? yeah. I was working in the video game industry. I worked at Rockstar Games for about four f four years. Um, so yeah, I've always sort of. Uh, I mean, I mean, it also goes goes back to um, to a college as well. And I've always sort of like done all the design on my books, the logos. Um, and in the case of this this book, I was friends with the writer, and he came to me and said. Uh, I mean, it was a writer Warren, Warren Ellis that had a lot of um, a lot of clout. I mean, he could kind of get get anything he wanted, and so he told me to just like make these like covers. He says, "I don't even care what they look like. I want them to look like nothing else that's out there in the stands." So I took this real photo-heavy approach, which is, uh, um, I guess, as far as these goes, it's most evident in the one on the right, like like a lot of photo photo collage. Um, and they were really weird, and I mean, I got nominated for an for an, for an award for them. I, I didn't win. Um, and since then, I've never gotten any cover work that wasn't my own. Book. <laughs> I don't know. I just think. I mean, I think a lot of editors look at something like that, and they just don't really know what to do what to do with it. It's they were at the time. They were incredibly striking. I don't think they looked like anything else. Um, so 2003, we come back to Becky with a with demo, and this is yeah. This was the this is the book I did when I decided to make comics my my career. Um, and uh, it's very serious book. Like I really sort of like. I, I really worked worked on this this book really really hard, <laughs> and uh, it was a real leap of faith. I mean, I I quit my job at Rockstar um, the same month the first issue of this came out, and I had like a bit of like stock option money, so I was able to sort of like see to see it through. But and this was like as as indie a comic book as you can get, so it was sort of like a big leap of faith. Um, just kind of like say. You know, to sort of announce this is my career when it wasn't even close to to paying my phone phone bill, much less anything else. Um, and it's sort of like a very indie, very street level, very very personal take on on uh, super, uh, superhero heroes, um, mostly like like the X Men style style of superhero heroes. And almost to the point of not being recognizable as that, like I really kind of broke it, broke it down. And uh, the big joke was that it was it wasn't demo, it was uh, emo. I got that. I still get that a joke ten years later. Um, so, but it was it was really it it really did sort of like signal a shift in my focus and sort of like uh, I mean before this I was doing like books about like bike messengers with the guns you know so this is a very this is a very deliberate move into more serious ter territory i think the next that was an anthology series each issue was its own story yeah, yeah. and following that same model in 2005 i think an even more serious work is is local yeah it was definitely yeah, I, mean, it was, I would say it was as serious, serious. It was a lot more like it had a clearer fo focus, I think, and I and I was better at it. Like I was, um, I had sort of learned how to write a short com comic book story on demo, so I could really kind of kind of apply that that here. 
And this had a sort of a additional hook of a, a recurring single character. It also, basically, it was a it was a gimmick. It, like it was is. it was meant to be uh, a way to sort of like basically increase sales. But but I set each st each story in a in a real uh, city in in America or in Canada, where, where I knew there was like a strong comic, comic book scene. So the, the idea was that, you know, there'd be a lot of like local interest, you know. Um, I could travel there if it was close, close enough and do signings, or if it wasn't there, the, the store in that town could possibly make a, make a big deal out of it. Um, and that was the first project they did with Ryan Kelly, who is also like a friend now and a, a work partner, a, part, a partner of many years. So that brings us up to 2006. Uh, there, you had a lot of different things going on in 2006. I think four different publishers. Does that sound right? Um, yeah, yeah I think so. I think so. I this know, is only a couple. <laughs> This yeah, is, I mean, all these things sort of happen at once, like local and these two two books um, were basically in the same year. And then there was Pounded, I think, was the same year? That was earlier. Uh, DMZ started, started around this time. Okay. Uh, so we can skip ahead. And that takes us into the Vertigo years, oh, which wow. is, yeah. And that's a little piece of Brian Wood art there, I think. Yeah, it is. I, I, uh, this is actually um, a project, uh, D, DMZ, that I... Um, I decided I was going going to draw. I was going to get back into it, and so I did a bunch of art for the, for this thing and pitched it to Vertigo. Uh, um, and they said, "Well, well, we like this story, but we're not going to hire you to try to draw it." Which is like the story of my life. And I think that was when I just quit. I was like, "All right, it's just not going to happen." Um, we well, did covers for the. I did. I did. They they threw me a consolation prize, and I did covers for for a while. Um, so, which was which was nice. Uh, yeah. So that's my cover there on the left. Um, yeah. And so that was like a that was also my first monthly sort of ongoing for hopefully many, many years, eventually did become many, many years. Um, first, first time I'd ever done, done a project of that potential length. Do you want to talk about what DMZ is about a little bit? Yes. Um, it really picked up a lot of those same sort of uh, like angry themes that, that were in Chan Channel Zero, but it was a lot more sort of con controlled and uh, balanced. And it was about a uh, future second American civil war. Um, it was very much fo focused on the island of Man Manhattan and as like a no man's land, as the DMZ and this sort of struggle that's been ongoing for like many, many years. Um, and there's a, a, jour a journalist that's kind of like, you know, makes his way into the city to sort of like make his, his career by finding stories to tell that, you know, are contained within this sort of like very hostile, very, very... Uh, sort of impossible for any anybody else to like access um city so i mean it's a very very much a new york book um it was very much about like current current events at the time which was to 2005 i think was when i got it approved the, the dmz in question is manhattan island right yes yeah. yeah um and i really sort of i mean i picked up a lot of the same channel channel zero themes but i really told myself you know i mean i had gotten accused of being like some lefty nutbag on that book so i was like i'm just going to i mean uh, possibly i am a lefty nutbag but i'm not gonna make it ob obvious i'm gonna try to present everything in this book as balanced as i as i possibly can um which uh I mean, I mean, re results may have varied, but I did. That was really my like effort and, and a driving sort of focus of this book, um, to not make it so there's an identi identifiable good good or bad side. And this book ran for for six years. It's, there's 12 volumes of it. Um, it worked out well. That was also at uh, Vertigo. You did New York Five, New York Four. Yeah. Northlanders. Yeah. Nor Nor Northlanders was my second ongoing monthly book, and that was like. Uh, uh, um, I mean, it's about about Vikings for sh for sure, um, which is kind of like an oddball thing for me to do. Um, but it kind of, I think that book sort of. Um, I think I, weirdly enough, I feel like I put as 
um, more of myself into it, or like I like identified with it more than than anything thing else. Um, I just told these like real sort of tragic stories about Vikings that weren't a, that weren't the stuff that everybody thinks of when they think about Vikings, but a lot of like like the social sort of world of the times. Um, I kind of said it at the point when there's a lot of re religious strife and conversion happening, which I found a lot of interesting things there. And um, yeah, there's just like these really cr like powerful human dramas about sort of people in in the middle of strife in the middle of very harsh land landscapes um and somehow i i really i found out i had like a lot of that in me um ready to tell a lot of that stories in, in, me, in me to write um and that book ran for for four years i think um that's good and the new york four and the new york five i was asked to actually write a young a young adult book <clears throat> for uh, girls and uh, I, I had a blast uh, Ryan, R Ryan Kelly the artist that worked on local uh, drew it and I that's pro probably the book I've had the most fun doing and I have the most fun reading again I usually don't I usually can't even op open up my books afterwards um, but that I like looking through it because uh, I felt like it was um, I felt like it was a very effortless process and it just came out really, really good. Um, so those, those are my Vertigo books. So after Vertigo, you became a free agent. And we've got your, uh, some modern stuff here. You're back to Image with Mara. Uh, a lot of Marvel work in the mutant world. Yep. And let's skip ahead one. Uh, Conan, Star Wars. Uh, those are both from Dark Horse, which is the same publisher as The Massive. And do you want to say anything about any of these? Yeah, I mean, I sort of, uh, I mean, up until this time, up until like a year and a half ago, I was really the guy that that didn't work on company-owned books or licensed books. I always, always did my my own stuff, um, <clears throat> for better or for worse. I mean, there's definitely cons. There's definitely upsides and down downsides to that. Um, so when I sort of like, I mean, I, I was under contract at DC all this time. And so once I came, came out of that, I had these like long running monthly books and under my belt and I got a lot of job, job offers. And I just kind of recognize it as like my time to sort of give, give this a shot. Um, I mean, I, I've been writing comic, comic comics like 12, 12 years at that time. Um, and so I'm like, you know, I've like never written like a licensed book, so I'm just going to take on all this work and give it a try and see what it's like. And so the first one was was um, Conan, which I basically treated just like a Northlanders book, and so I had a lot of fun with fun with that. And, um, and Becky drew the first few issues. Yes, so Becky, who worked on Jenny One and Demo, and. Um, and I get a lot of personal pleasure out of that. I mean, I'm I was neither a Conan hater or or a fan. Like I didn't really think that that much much about it. Um, and so I like approached it from like a very much like an outsider's point of, point of view, which is what the company wanted at the time. So I'm writing a very atypical Conan book, um, which which infuriates the certain pretty small but extremely vocal. And a sometimes very threatening fan fan base. I get a lot of. I have gotten a lot of really really extreme homophobic hate letters um, for <laughs> for making Conan something less than like a two dimensional steroid case. Apparently, um, so that's and I've. I mean, it like really alarmed me at the time. I've sort of like come to like enjoy it, uh, riling them up. I mean, the the book's doing doing great. Um, so yeah, obviously, uh, you know, like I'm not doing doing a bad a bad job. So it's fun. Um, and in terms of licensed books, you couldn't get any more licensed than Star Wars and the X Men. Those are probably the two yeah, most. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. These are jobs I didn't feel like I could say no to. I mean, I didn't pitch for any of this. They all came to me. Um, Star Wars came to me um it's i can't exactly i can't remember exactly how they fra phrased it but they wanted like it was already su su supposed to be a comic set using those original characters um and i sort of worked up a pitch and again it was like very much like like a personal approach um i'm i'm not a huge star wars fan i'm definitely am a fan and there's like a 
you know, like I, I have an attachment to those early films. So I like I zeroed in on exactly what what I wanted to uh, write. And uh, they they said yes, and uh, it's, also, it's also been doing really really well. Um, and I feel like it's it's sort of um, it's definitely made me a better writer working on this stuff. There's a lot of like there's a lot of problem solving when you're adapting something or you're working with pre pre existing characters and worlds that I hadn't ever had to deal with um, up until this this point. <laughs> Uh, and all this brings us up to the next slide, which is uh, the Massive. Um, and we have some art here from the Massive. We have a variety. I think that's Christian Donaldson, that slide? Yes, it is. Can just slide through some of these. These are just some, uh, some I did pieces that. of promotional I did that. art. Some of my designs. This is familiar to anybody here. This is John Paul. Yep. We can keep going. Uh, that's particularly. Yes, yeah, slide back. I like that one a lot. That's that's my art. Oh. I, I was able to sort of like you know get get a few things out with this with this book. Uh, you know, you pressure them them into it basically. There's a print you did that was a fundraiser for the CBLDF, I think. You know, promotional art. Go forward. There we go. That the bottom half of the trade, I think. Yeah. There we go. The uh, one on the who did the one on the right, the all uh, blue. That's John John Paul. John Paul. The blue one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's some really nice evocative work in this book. There we go. Those are the left is John Paul too. Oh God. Yeah, that is you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's it. There we go. So that's pretty much it. 1997 to to date. Did we miss anything big in there? This is nothing. Nothing big. Just the uh, I guess just the X Men stuff I'm doing, which it's the X Men. Well, so, <laughs> I mean I love the X Men, but you know there's I mean there's not a whole lot more to say about it than it's the X Men. That pretty much brings us up. So let's 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 get into it. The uh, <laughs> we see we see through here we see a couple of different themes. We see individuals that are working against kind of oppressive systems and we see semi post apocalyptic. Would you say fully post apocalyptic or Yeah, that's a it's a term I really try to avoid. Um, I feel like it's really kind of a kind of a played out term. I mean every I mean we'll it see, definitely it fits. But, dystopian, uh, how's that? Sure. Yeah. Semi dystopian. Uh between Jenny One through DMZ and on into the mass. They, they always stick very close to like our time. Like nothing's very like far far flung. It's not like a mad a Mad Max uh, movie. Um because I feel like um I feel like it's important to have like a, a relatable a story as possible. I always call it like access points. I want the the reader to be able to sort of enter the story. Um, and I was I feel like maybe it's me personally, but I sort of feel like I like I have a harder time doing that when something is so foreign, like the world and the story. Um, so so if I tell something like I'm talking about uh, something that has yet to happen, at least visually, I like to have it look as 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 current as possible. I think what's interesting about all those books is that they are relatable, like the technology and, and the worlds look basically contemporary, but they're still wildly different than what we know. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the world building and how you create that yeah, that it's, type of uh, dystopia? It's, it's really, I mean, it all comes down to what I just said about, you know, um, I mean, there's there's stories I want to tell. Like I want to talk about like a war torn Man Manhattan. Um, so I mean, that's that's sort of what 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 I want to do, and I have to figure out how to build build that in a way that's uh, um, again there are these these access points. Like like I said, and I even do I even kind of take take that that same approach when I'm talking about my uh, historical book about Vikings. Um, Again, I mean, I basically tr treated his history as its own sort of separate world, and figured out how to present it in a way that's relatable to to us now. Um, I mean, I did that through like a variety of of ways, but but I guess I I don't see a difference between something that's said in the in the past or the future as far as that goes. I, I guess the difference is that in the past it's a research element, but for the future it's something that you're building from the ground up. Yeah, I mean, you can you can only research 
only so much. I mean, a lot of a lot of that Nor that Northlander stuff. Um, I mean, it was a it wasn't a, a literate culture for a lot of that time. So there's not a lot of written history. There's stuff that was written centuries after about it. So I, I really there was a lot of like common sense application there. Um, because I, I mean, I considered details of like clothing and what the inside of their houses would look like, and so I would do a lot of sort of like mental exercise exercises where I would try to figure out what what a Viking stove would be, bearing in mind, like I mean, it was really I I went really overboard, but I'm like, what kind of stones do they have in Nor Norway? I would look it up, you know, like how would they build a, a hearth or whatever? I mean, it's crazy. You traveled there too, right? I did. I, yeah. I mean, after the book was it was already going. Um, I mean, I definitely learned there's such a thing as too much research uh, on that book. Uh, yeah. But um, with regards to the massive, how much do you know about the world that you're writing about? I mean, do you have it? Is it fully fleshed? Are you living no, there? No, no, and yeah. it's and and that's fine. I mean, I'm sort of like, I mean, I'm sort of taking like a, a less is more research search approach with the massive, and. Um, I mean, I have the whole world as the the sort of setting for the story, and I'm I'll eventually get there. Like the the boat travels around, and um, when I any you know, I'm sort of like dividing the world up into areas for each part of this the story. I'm like, now this is gonna gonna be the the South America part of the story, and you know, I think about this is a, a environmental collapse. I sort of look like which cities are prone to like flooding. Again, I'm getting into the too much research phase here. <laughs> but it's really, um, I mean, this is a much more of like an imagination based story than possibly other things. Um, DMZ was like set in New York where I live. And I felt a real, I felt the, uh, the burden to get it right, to get everything right. Because um, there are a lot of people, friends of mine, that were going to call me on it if I didn't, you know? Um, so here I'm sort of like letting it go a bit and playing a little bit faster and looser with the science. And again, I'm, I'm making up, up a lot of stuff. I'm kind of, I, I don't know how much detail I want to get into with the massive because the plot unfolds and there's, I, I don't want to spoil anything for anybody. But uh, if you want to talk just a little bit about, it, climate change is a central aspect of it that is. book. I it's, don't think that's a spoiler for anybody. No. <laughs> it's sort of, um, there's there's a real mystery there. Basically, um, how I phrase it is I say, if you take every sort of warning that we hear from climate science, scientists about what's going to happen, like if we don't do, you know, do X, Y, or Z, um, you know, Every, all those warnings, everything they say is going to eventually happen in the, in the story, it all happens over the course of like a single year. It's like like crazy, unexplainable crash. It's called the crash in this in the story because that that leads to like subsequent ec ec economic crash and societal crash and basically the world goes to goes to hell. And there's this mystery because no one knows why. No one knows why everything happened all at once earlier than it, than it was supposed to. And that's sort of like uh that's sort of like the background mystery of the story. So that's all I'll say say about it because that that sort of gradually unfolds as we go. And the cast are like sort of like Greenpeace type environmentalists on boats that were largely sort of spared a lot of the the disaster because they're out in the ocean and uh, they they're basically presented with the fact that they failed I mean this is they've dedicated their life to you know saving the world as, as they say, and the world ended. I mean, they, they failed, so, so what did they do now? So there's a lot of like, you know, sort of like identity themes in there as they try to figure out, you know, as they try to get a, get a handle on it and sort of like tour the world and see everything, um, pick up bits and pieces of the mystery as they go. And there's also storylines related to, um, their their past they they all sort of come from like a violent past like whether they're ex you know mercenary soldiers one of them is an ex child soldier um they'll have these sort of violent pasts which they've left behind when they became sort of environmental activists and because the world's changed they sort of like find themselves 
um, slipping back into these violent roles by necessity in order to to survive or like against their their better nature in nature so there's that there's a lot of like personal stories mixed up in this huge big big story about the about the world um what do you think so in terms of your overall body of work we're kind of looking at uh, the same kind of dystopian themes from Ginny one but you're that's what is that 15 years ago yeah. How do you <laughs> what what do you think has changed in your brain since you were writing that as a college student versus um, now as a professional and an adult and all those things? I mean, it's really it's just like per perspective and life experience. I mean, I could, I mean, I, I was allowed to be like the angry arts art student then. I mean, because I was like 26, and that was kind of all. <laughs> I mean, I didn't really have any responsibility. I hadn't really like sort of like. I hadn't been like challenged, I guess, by life or by anybody, by any person, um, and you know that sort of thing is like very, very much encouraged in school. So I was very indulged in that, and um, and it was also again going back to this pre nine nine eleven thing. It was very easy to just kind of like rant against authority. It was very, it was almost like a very safe thing for like a kid to do or like a young person to do. Um, they, it was a very easy boogie boogeyman, um, free, freedom of speech, you know. And so, I mean, but then when I did DMZ, um, I was like, older and uh, like the Iraq war and everything, and suddenly there was like so many con conflicting opinions. There are a lot of like ways to like look at something, or I was old enough to sort of recognize this. Um, and uh, it was less easy to like point to like like this person's bad and this person's good, so that was why I sort of um, approached that book the way the way I did. Or I'm just gonna like I'm gonna you know play, like assume the the conscience of both both sides in that story. Um, um, and. Uh, you know now, like I mean, I have like a couple of kids, which puts a whole other spin on things. Um, I have a much more comfortable life. I'm not like eating ramen noodles like I used to, and the ma the massive. It's almost like a. There's a lot of pol politics around climate science and climate change, and I didn't even want to want to go there. Like I deliberately set this book after the crash, so I didn't have to have that get in the, get in the way of the story. Um, I mean, a really alarming thing fairly recently is I think I like tweeted out some something about climate change and was shocked to see how many people following me on Twitter don't believe in it. <laughs> and so, like, I'm glad I didn't go there because I don't want to have to deal with that. Like, I mean, I don't know. I, I did not want that to become what this book is about. Um, when to me, it's like about. Um, I'm almost like by, uh, bypassing pol uh, politics and dealing with sort of like like how it impacts societies and pe 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 people in a in a non non political way. So uh, I mean may maybe this is me finally moving past that. I don't know. I I think for something that's I mean climate change is kind of the thrust and the the impetus, but it's really a pretty apolitical book aside from the. Yeah, we'll we'll get there. I mean I feel like I mean like with, without really saying anything at all, this has a. Everything's going to come to such a pointed ending, such a specific ending that's already fully planned out. Um, and so, like, I'm loath to even talk talk about it. I mean, so it's going to become and it's going to be be brought back up, possibly not in the way every, anybody thinks. Um, but you're right; it isn't it isn't like ov overt in the way other books were. Oh, and I think it's also interesting that a lot of the characters come from like wildly divergent political backgrounds. Like yeah. you have some fascist characters, and I mean they're all dealing with it in a different way, but they're not your particular brand of protagonist. Yeah, I mean I I started this immediately after DM, DMZ, and so there were a couple of things I didn't wanted to want to do, and I really felt like I'd had my fill of writing a story set in in, in America about about Amer Americans. So in the, in this book. And no one's American, or, or, or there's one who's like a minor character, and um, everybody's from every everywhere. Like it's a real like sort of like hodge hodgepodge, which again is a sort of like um, you know requires research a bit, um, just like stretching muscles that I hadn't really really used before writing muscles, um, and I think makes for like a different. Uh, 
like a different vibe to the story. You know? Yeah. <clears throat> Let's talk about the art a little bit. Um, as an artist yourself, if you could talk about writing for an artist yep. and a little bit about what Gary Brown, who I think is the current artist and yep. drew half of this book on the screen here, yep. what he brings to it. Um, well, my general, I mean, I, I know what it's like to be an art, art artist and have someone tell you what to, what to draw. Which is kind of all what what my job is is basically writing like pages and pages of telling pe people what to what to do. Um, so I I try to really stay stay out of their way as much as I can. Um, I like I'm 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 very aware of I'm constantly checking myself to make sure I'm not like you know overly guiding their 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 hand or making them do draw draw something that's not in their nature like every artist i work with i like look at everything they've done i try to identify <clears throat> what they're good at and what they're not not good at what i ask them what they like to draw um because i mean i can spend three three days writing a script for a comic and they're going to spend a month and a half you know drawing drawing it so i'm i'm in no position to like boss them them around um their 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 job is hard so so that's what it is. I mean, I, I write to their strengths. I stay out of their way. I give them as much sort of like freedom and leeway in the script as long as the story is still getting told. They can get there any way, any way they want. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm told by them that I write very easy scripts for, the, for them to uh, draw and that I tend to sort of, um, I, I, I don't crowd the, pa the pages with, with a lot of action or a lot of like, you know, there's not a lot of pe people in each panel, which I guess is like a kind of a common thing in superhero com comics. Um, so, so that's that's nice to hear that I'm that I'm making their lives easier, and not not harder. And and Gary Gary Brown, he um, he's a guy that's been had been emailing me for a couple of years um, as as a student showing showing me his work and so i've kind of like been been watching him you know grow grow a bit over over these years and seeing some like work he's done he's he's fairly young he's recently out of uh, college and um and i mean a book like this this is a not a not easy book to draw and so it was a bit like kind of throwing him into the deep end but he had his work has a lot of emotion and and weight and he Conveyed the characters' age ages well, which which was important to me in this in this book because they're all older. They all have like a lifetime. They all have like a previous life of of uh, experience, you know. So I really, I mean, I think he brings he brings that like sort of like serious seriousness and weight to everybody's face, which which is an important thing uh, to me. And he can draw water, which is a really hard thing for any anybody to draw. Um, yeah, I, I can't draw he, water. Yeah, it's, it's not just the water, but like the ships and like the in the current storyline with the the oil rigs and stuff. Like yeah. he really gives a, a weight and a dimension to that big heavy machinery. That's uh, it adds a lot of. Uh, yeah, I would just say like in, in the scripts, I'm like, I'm sorry, Gary, draw the the oil oil rig again in the in the storm. I'm sorry to make you draw it again. We got to do it. <laughs> draw it any size you want. I don't care. When when you're writing a page. In your brain, do you see the page the way you draw it, and you have to curb your instincts at all, or do you? No, I I, I did. Um, I sort of like trained myself not to because um, um, in in order to like make the artist do what's what's in your 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 head, it requires a lot of that guidance and sort of like like virtually standing over their their shoulder um so i i have zero i mean it's it t it took a while but i learned to have like kind of zero expectations um about what the page will look like i, I let them do it um, it saves it saves a lot a lot of my stress too um i think we're gonna just talk really quickly about the particular type of research and your influences for the massive in particular, and then we'll go to the uh, go to the crowd for questions. Um, 
This is a hard question to answer because I never have. There's there's never a single thing that well, let that me is preface an it real quick okay. by saying that a lot of the the mechanics, the like technology of the world in the massive, yeah. seems incredibly contemporary and realistic. Like I don't feel like there's anything that's particular, particularly science fiction about it. But it is set, you know, slightly in the future. It is a different world, yeah. and so I'm just wondering if there's anything that you're looking at contemporary, like popular mechanics or anything where you're. There's this website that I spend a lot of time on, and I can't, I, I can't remember what it's called. Uh, it's like. It's it's basically a website of photo galleries of weird old Russian stuff, like rusted out ships in the inside of. And you may have heard. I don't know. Um, no, so that sounds. That's right. exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> so there was. Um, I mean, this that ship in the book is like a real. It's like a Canadian Coast Guard vessel, and I was kind of unable to find any good good reference for that. So I went on his website and scoured around until I found like a appropriately grimy sort of rundown ship. And so it's like awesome because now we know exactly what the bathroom looks like and the kitchen and all the pipes that run in the hallways and everything. So I'm. I mean, stuff like, like that is really helpful, and I try to do as much of that as I can because, again, the the artist, like, they have enough work to worry about without trying to look on the internet to figure out what I'm talking about. You know, that's my job. Um, to like, I mean, I, I include links and everything in the in this in the scripts. Um, so, I mean, I I use Google Earth constantly. Um, Wikipedia is always op open. I have a really good res resource that I have yet to use in my sister-in-law, who's a federal agent for NOAA. And that's, I'm almost afraid to like go there with like questions because I feel like I'm just going to get too much, you know. <laughs> but I mean, her job is basically going out after pirates on the ocean, you know. Um, basically, is what she does. So that's that's an untapped res resource. I think I'll eventually eventually have to use. Um, but yeah, it's not a science fiction really story. I mean, there may be bits of it here or there as we go. Um, if anything, it's sort of like a little bit, like it's a little, little bit retro in the sense that I, I frequently flash back, like five, ten, twenty, uh, twenty years in the lives of these uh, characters. Um, um, so I'm finding a lot of in interest in that. <laughs> Oh, uh, cool. I think we can go to the audience. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Does anyone have a question? Sorry. Um, it can be it be about anything. It doesn't have to be. A, it could be an X X Men question, <laughs> which, which I know you're all dying to ask. Uh, just a general question on some of your influences, comic book wise, <laughs> or otherwise, that's not the comics. Um, I'm mostly influenced by by my friends that also do do comics. Like I don't, I don't, I don't really really read a lot of comics. Um, I I used to read read a lot lot more, and I read a lot of manga. Um, I was really working for like most of my career outside of whatever everybody else was doing. Like I wasn't doing superhero books. I was kind of doing like my own weird indie books way, way over over here. I didn't like fit into any sort of clique or anything. So um, I, I had friends and I would read everything they did. Um, try to try to write a better if I could. Um, looked looked at a lot of manga and European art just because it was different. Um, it was one of the problems I've I've had, especially when I'm doing a book like The Massive, is a lot of the the artists that that are avail available have like careers but behind them of drawing superhero books and everything. Even though it's not a superhero story, kind of looks like it, you know. So I was always sort of looking at at different things to find uh, sort of ways to to not not be sort of like have that that vibe to it but now i mean i don't it's rare i read comics i still read read a couple of friends but i always make this joke it's kind of like like it lost a lot of, a lot of its magic like you like when you know how how a hot dog is made you know <laughs> like i'm so i've made so many, so many comics that if i open one one up i i can never get get lost in the story i'm like thinking about like choices the creators made or who the colorist is or there's a lettering mistake or something like I'm too like aware of the process um, which is which is kind of a shame so 
Um, I read a lot of non nonfiction. I think that's where most of my my inspiration comes from. You mentioned uh, identity being part of you know the writing process for a lot of these books, which makes sense. Um, also, in reading both the Massive and Conan, kind of at the same time, and even Star Wars, I guess to a lesser degree, um, morality seems to be a big part, and the ambiguity, the kind of what you mentioned before, how you know being the angry college student, black and white, you know, good evil, but all the gray areas in between, and in Mara, I think as well. Um, just if you could talk about how writing all these books at the same time, how what that process is like, how to get your head into each, you know, sphere, each uh, book as you're doing it. Um, I really keep a lot of notes. Um, like I have notebooks for each project, and that's where I do all my early drafts. Like I write out by uh, hand, I'll like outline entire story story arcs and. Um, so th when it's time to start writing a massive script, I'll dig through and I'll find like my massive notebook and I'll read through and I'll basically catch myself up with what's happening recently <laughs> in my own scripts. And sort of, uh, it just, I think it's like a mental thing. It just kind of gets me into the right mindset. Um, and uh, it was actually just a today, I actually handed in a massive script and my editor's like, like, like this is like, what's going on? This like contradicts so much in the last script. It's because I didn't really keep good enough notes or I didn't, I was a very slop, sloppy, I guess, in that. So, you know, that, that was actually like, sort of like underscored the, the importance of, of this, this process that, that I've, that I've had. Um, but ultimately it's just not that hard. And that was kind of a surprise. I'm writing six books now, um, which is really absurd. And it's, there's only been a couple times I've I've had things like kind of bleed bleed over. I've somehow managed to like compartmentalize it all. They're all very different books, which I think think helps. It's not like I'm writing six soup soup superhero books, you know. Um, but that that mistake I made today was like really really bad. It was embarrassing. So. Any more questions? Hi. Um, when you write your scripts for, for Gary, even for, for when you wrote them for Christian, um, do you kind of have a specific layout in mind or do you uh, 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 leave that to the, to the artist? Because I've noticed uh, the difference with Christian. There was a lot more panels on the pages and with Gary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Christian was, um, he's such like a, a precise and detail oriented art, artist that when, when he left and Gary, like, I think he really got burnt out on that. Um, Gary came in, who's a very different kind of artist and it really changed what the book, the book is. And I feel like that's something you really will only see in, I mean, in uh, comics really where, where the artist will have such a, a has has such imp importance that they can completely alter the direction of the story just by being being them, and so I had this this artist who was like darker and moodier and less pre precise in terms of like drawing like screws and bolts and nuts and everything on everything. Um, that the story that's when the story became like there there was a shift more towards who the characters were and their pasts and their own personal sort of demons, and less about like how cool that oil rig looks, you know, or this, this battle or, or whatever. And I think it changed it for the better. Um, and I'm definitely happy about it. Um, but I, I don't give layouts. There's only like, in, you'll see in the massive, there's pages that are like, sort of like news captioned, almost like, like news stills, like, like photos. And those are all sort of like three on a page stacked. And that's like a recurring thing. And so that's a, that's a rare instance where I'll sort of, tell them like exactly how to like lay out the page. Um, but usually I kind of leave it up to them unless there's like a specific reason, like a story related reason. Again, it's like, I'm just like, you know, they got, their job is hard enough. Recently on your website, you, uh -oh. uh, <laughs> no, this is, uh, 
posted or released a PDF file of a pitch that you did for DMZ. Uh, oh, the, the TV pitch. Yes, the yeah. television pitch. I think, I don't know if you specified the cable channel or if you just said general cable yeah. channel. Uh, that was something recent or that was a while ago or is that? That was, um, no, I, I was definitely asked to uh, do it. Um, by DC or by Warner, Warner Brothers, who owns DC. Um, that's the second time they asked me to work up uh, other media pitch, only to completely waste my time, time with it. So that's the last last time I'll do it. They have they sort of Warner Brothers has an option on it, um, and there have been several attempts. I feel very half half-hearted ones for them to like adapt it into something, and. Uh, I don't know. I've, I despair of, of it. I, I feel feeling it'll never happen. Um, but that was that was an example of them sort of like, you know, basically like like you know, asking for my input. And so like I wrote up, you know, basically according to to a few few notes they had, a version of DMZ that sort of like fit into the sort of like show they wanted. Like it was a younger cast and. Uh, like I made everybody younger and brought some some new characters in, and uh, it just never it never went anywhere. So, yeah. And so, and so that was like me posting that on, on, on my website was kind of like an F you to them. I'm like, well, if you're not going to do anything, it's just sitting here for for years. It's been sitting here, so I'll just put it online. Okay. So, uh, two more questions. Okay, we'll take. Let's take this one first, and then. All right, I'll ask the requisite X-Men question. Um, what was it that attracted you to an all X-Men, an all female X-Men cast? That was that was Marvel's idea. Um, they have a, a extremely vocal advocate in their editorial ranks for more female sort of led or or more female characters basically out there and. Uh, she she actually told me she's been pushing for this for many many years, and it just kind of came to to this this point where I mean it's like everything kind of like al aligned right, where there was a chance to to re relaunch the book. Like I was already kind of working on on X Men books, and I have a history of writing female casts and female led led stories. And she just that that was when she when she was finally able to get it approved, and I'm just like I'm just awesome, great. I mean, I, it wasn't my pitch or anything. Um, so yeah, I'm all, I'm all for it. So. Hi, thanks. Um, so you said in the beginning of your career, a lot of your work was like characterized by being indie or like self-crafted, like the stories, the characters, the world, everything, you know, and there must have been a lot of like freedom there, or it must have felt kind of, I don't know if you were, had anything to get liberated from at that point, but it must have felt very free and loose. Uh, what is it like moving into more licensed material? Like, was was that a rough transition, or was it kind of comforting to have more sort of rigid guidelines? Right. I don't know if it's com I don't know if I use the word comforting. It was definitely like it didn't bother bother me. Like I think what I just had to uh, do, and I felt like I I had seen enough of my friends and my peers deal with this first that I sort of knew what what I had to do. Is you just kind of get your mind mind straight. Like um, X Men. Like that is not my my story. You know, like Star Wars. I mean, I mean, it doesn't matter how much freedom I have. At the end of the day, it's really not not mine. Like they can come along and change it, and they often do. Um, so I just kind of get that straight in my head at the very, very be beginning. Um, and so it doesn't, I mean, it's rare anything like, like that bother, it bothers me, and it's rare that I resent some guidelines. Um, once in a while, I'll like bitch, bitch about it, but really it's fine. Um, it's just, it's a job, you know. Um, I mean, I came from like, you know, like an art school background where I could kind of do do anything, and I definitely very very much enjoyed that for like a lot of years. 
but I'll, like, like I said earlier, um, like I've never written books like like this before, and it's still kind of novel. Like it's still kind of like an interesting ex experience. I don't know how, how long it's going to last last for before it starts to grind me down. Um, but there's like a lot of there's a lot of things that that I can see eventually grinding me down. Stuff that's all all about sales or about money or about like budget. We don't have the budget for that. You know, the budget for this artist. Um, you know, or some random executive doesn't like something, so you have to change it, like stuff like that. And it's like, I don't know. I'm real. I'm really trying hard just to roll with it for like my own sake, you know. Um, so, like I said, I mean, I'm gonna see how it goes, you know. So this is like I, I view this as like a temporary thing in my career, doing all this licensed stuff. Like I said, all these jobs kind of came to my door. I didn't feel like I could say say no. Um, so. You know, I don't. I don't think. I mean, I, I hope in five years I won't be still seeking it out. I feel like I'll hope I'll be doing more stuff like 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 the massive. Cool. I think that's. I think that's it. Thank you so much. Now you can sign the massive. Over okay. Here. Good. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you.